On this episode, I speak to critically acclaimed landscape photographer Melvin Nicholson. It's not just about how to create the perfect landscape, but actually how to run a landscape photography workshop, something different that he's uh, usually used to. He makes his money purely from landscape workshops, and I thought it'd be an interesting conversation to bring to yourself. So I enjoyed the conversation. I hope you do too. This is The Photography Junkie. Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Photography Junkie. I'm your host Jay and on this week I am joined with a somebody that I've known for over 10 years at this point and and I wanted to uh, introduce Melvin Nicholson. Hi Jay, thanks for having me on. Thanks for coming on. Um, one of the reasons why I wanted to get you on the show is I've I've seen your journey um, from a from a personal perspective where things have gone wrong and then you've turned that around into basically something that a lot of um, landscape photographers uh, don't get to do and that's actually make some money. <laughs> make money from your hobby, yes, from your passion. Um, it's an interesting concept, I think. When I when I first turned pro nearly 10 years ago, it's my 10th year now, I mean, how time flies. Um, I was quite lucky, really, because my circumstances are still very similar. You know, being single with no children, very little responsibility in life, um, which helps maintain my youthful outlook, I am sure. Um, you know, I, I was able to take a chance and uh, fly solo and, and do what I love to do, which was to, having come in out of a, a nursing industry, uh, my desire to help people but just in a different way, now with a camera rather than in a hospital uh, environment. And um, I must admit, the the mixture of being able to help people, along with my love and passion for landscape photography and my desire to travel and discover new places, that, that was just a heaven-sent mix of perfection for me. And so whatever I earned, whatever I could generate to keep myself afloat, was a huge bonus, and I'd always compare it to what I would have perhaps have earned had I stayed as a you know in the nursing industry or the care industry, um, or any industries that I worked in previous to that, uh, and it was fairly comparable reasonably quickly. But the ability to be able to uh, monetize, uh, which is a, a very modern phrase, uh, your hobby, your passion, um, you know, I've been very blessed to be, to have been able to do that and to continue that ten years on. So it's something that a lot of landscape photographers are not able to do. For, for many people, it, it remains just a hobby. And taking that sort of leap in terms of uh, earning, usually the, the way from that is to get your work into galleries. Um, but you decided to go a different route. Yeah, I mean, the world's changed in the last sort of 10 years and quite dramatically. I know in the, in the years preceding, uh, when I turned pro, I would say the, the basis of most photographers' income was uh, either weddings, you know, that never goes out of fashion. People do still seem to want to get married and, and still want photographers there, which is fantastic for that genre of photography. But it was really stock photography, you know, stock libraries, um, print and uh, books and various things, and the printed media. But to be honest, I mean, that's, um, that's, that's a dying art now, unfortunately. And as a consequence, um, you have to look at a business model away from that. But I was never really into that. And so I never came into it, uh, you know, into photography as a wedding photographer. I never really had to, uh, to make money uh, in any other way other than run tours and workshops. And they started off as you know, six hour days in the Lake District at 35 pounds a day. I mean, back in 2012, 2013, uh, start very, very small, you know, offer your services for next to nothing and build up a fan base, follower base, uh, a very loyal band of, uh, you know, of, of clients 
and really just start from a very, very small uh, platform and then organically, that's the key word there, organically, allow things to grow over the years. And because I've not been in any, any hurry and I've not really had to sit there and think this has got to happen by this time next year, I've kind of just gone with the flow. I've maybe put certain things into place that has facilitated my, uh, you know, uh, the, the business growth, uh, running Facebook groups, um, joining the camera club, uh, you know, judging internationally, uh, getting your name out there in a whole sort of swathe of, of mediums, I think is really important. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. And uh, But really, yeah, it was always about helping people, um, you know, from when I went from yeah, care work and nursing into the photography industry. It was just a natural extension, really. And so I was really quite lucky that it's never really been any different to me. Sort of the route that I chose and, you know, still continue to do so. So um, which gets you the most excited, cityscapes or landscapes? I'd have to say landscapes. <laughs> but having recently returned from Japan, where I did three weeks uh, out there, I mean, Tokyo is crazy oh wow when you land in tokyo the first night that uh, we were in tokyo there was a couple of us and you're walking around the streets of tokyo and we were in uh, shinjuku which is the very heart of the red light district of tokyo but it's where all the bright lights are it's where a lot of the um it's just very vibrant let me put it that way uh, very safe and very you know organized but it's uh, still there's a lot of noise there's just a, a lot of stuff going on and it's a sensory overload. So in that environment, a city can be really exciting. Uh, and what I find with Tokyo, as opposed to a lot of places that I go to uh, abroad, is it felt completely safe. You never felt as though you had to watch your equipment in the same way that you would if you went to Barcelona or anywhere like that. And so it actually allowed you to really kind of concentrate on the photography side of things and really immerse yourself and not really feel threatened. Um, it was quite a unique experience for me. I think in, in Japan, yeah. I would be found curled up in a room in a corner somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> and with good reason, Jay. I mean, it is, it is isn't it crazy. Uh, the madness I quite enjoy. I mean, you know, I'm from Blackpool. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's the Las Vegas of the UK. Well, it's the closest that we've got to it. It's not quite the same, but, you know, there are similarities in some ways. But, uh, but yeah, if you want a sensory overload, then definitely go into the cities. Um, because there's a lot of other things going on. Uh, whereas with landscapes, you can go somewhere new and be completely immersive in the landscape, but there's not a lot of external factors that you've got to worry about. Except maybe Canada and the bears. Uh, having to carry pepper spray for the bears uh, on your uh, waist belt, which is kind of weird. Um, but generally speaking, you can immerse yourself that much easier in the landscape than you can the cityscapes. I think sometimes it's good to mix it up, but Japan is a fantastic place to do cityscapes. It's amazing. I can, you know, a good friend of mine had gone out there recently, pretty much the week before, and did 10 nights out there just in Tokyo. Im images are fabulous, you know, so there's, there's, uh, I think there's room for both, you know, cityscapes and landscapes, but I have to say fundamentally, I am a landscape photographer. So, as I mentioned in the beginning, you and I have known each other for uh, over 10 years at this point and um, at the very beginning you were always uh, I would say stickler for traditional techniques and photography do you think that's changed over the year for you, over the years for you um, no I think it, it, it's a strange and it, it, I think nowadays when we talk about AI which is 50% scary 50% exciting. I can't really remember uh, a time, it's certainly in photography, where the landscape will change dramatically. And I mean that sort of, not geographically, I mean within the world of photography and I know there are many industries that are looking at AI with baited breast in one way or another. Um, and my, my, my techniques are, so I, I very rarely blend images through you know six or seven different uh, exposed images never change skies i'm quite a traditionalist in that sense and a lot of the work that i produce is quite realistic 
you know, um, some of the images perhaps from certain other workers almost go into a, a sort of a fairy tale, fine art uh, sort of look in which you know the world doesn't look the way that they portray it. So sort of like the over-saturated HDR shots? Yes. I mean, HDR is a lot better than it used to be. Um, I think nowadays it's sort of using luminosity masks. And to be fair, I don't use them, but I am going to have to get to grips with them. I do appreciate that. But um, for all the lack of the technology that I tend not to use, like luminosity masks, uh, incredibly rarely do I take six shots and merge them together. They is so, And with camera technology now, you know, quite often I will take one image and produce a, a frame from that one image, an image, you know, from, from one frame. And so by being able to pull out the highlights, uh, bring the highlights down, bring the detail out in the shadow, but there is there is a there is a, a reason for taking five images and different exposures and blending them together. I just don't tend to do it. Um, now, the, whether that makes me a dinosaur of technology, and at some point I am going to have to embrace that, but I hope that the imagery that I create is still real to the scene because in running workshops i've got a train of thought here that in running workshops whoever looks at the work that i produce i believe that has to be achievable by those that come in the workshop and i had this conversation recently with a client of mine i said so you go on a, a workshop with you know some very well-known photographers whose work you know looks otherworldly you know uh, there's detail in absolutely every facet of that image because of the you know multi uh, multi layers and and luminosity blending i said but you will go in that workshop and there'll be absolutely no way you'll produce work like that unless you've got a degree in photoshop or lightroom and i said but does that does that put you off going on and attending that workshop i said no we know we're not as good as the workshop leader they do it for a living and they've been doing it for many many years and they developed a style so I'm not going into an environment where I think I'm going to be able to, you know, capture and to emulate that work. And nor am I, um, you know, sort of uh, tricked into thinking that I will. And so maybe I hadn't given enough credit to the people on the workshops. But for me, it's quite important that what I get is what they can also get. And so therefore, there's an element of realism about that. Um, and so it is interesting. And the techniques are no different. Get it right in the field. I use filters. I use case filters. I'm a, I'm a pro partner of case filters. Try and get as much as you can done right in the camera. There's an element of art about photography. If you can take six images and blend them together and you spend more time on Photoshop creating than it took you in the field, I think there's something not fundamentally right about that. And for me, it's the process, it's the journey of going out with the camera on the right tripod, with the right equipment and knowing how to use it. That's the key thing there. And then getting something on camera that you can look at and think, okay, there's an element of experience and, and hopefully skill with the right equipment. And it's all come together. It's, you know, almost like you're baking a pie, I suppose. And, and then the elements are right there for you. And it just requires tweaking when you get home. I think that's more important to me than, than almost the resultant image, which is quite interesting. It's the journey more than the destination, I think, for me. So you are you are still happy to to tweak it once it once it gets home. I mean, you've got to. The, the, the problem is when you shoot on raw format. You know, it, it's a very flattened uh, version of events. I actually shoot JPEG and raw, and the reason for that is the JPEG, of course, is edited in camera. And it's probably much, much closer to what you saw at the time that you shot it. So I use the JPEG as a point of reference. I leave it on neutral filter. I don't put it into vivid. I don't enhance the colors. Quite often the colors are slightly subdued, but it's a closer representation to what I saw than the raw file. I build the raw file up to look quite a lot similar to the JPEG. Uh, and that's because the JPEG is more of an accurate representation of what I saw. So that's my take on it. Other people will just shoot raw. They'll get home, they'll look at the raw files and they'll think, oh, wow, how un uninspiring does a raw file look? And it, it is. Jeez, I mean, don't ever just open up a raw file and save it as a JPEG and leave it at that. You have to build up that raw file to have it look much closer to how you remembered the scene. 
But you could have 10 people stood there taking the same shot with the same equipment and then ask them to go away and all 10 images will be different. They'll be edited differently. There'll be different crops, different um, ways that they've gone about it. Someone will leave them very, very accurate. Well, I wouldn't say are all files accurate, far from it in a lot of ways. So, you know, uh, but I don't want to leave the editing to the camera. I know people will sometimes say, well, I shoot it in, J in JPEG and I don't edit it at all as though that's something to be quite proud of, but it's actually, you're leaving the editing to the camera when really it should be your work and the raw will allow you to get to that stage. Would, would so, you consider those as unfinished images then, the, the ones that shoot straight to JPEG? Um, you mean when I open up a raw file? In, in terms of how you view the image. For me for me personally, I, I don't put out an image unless I've edited it. Yes, I mean, I have to edit every one of them. I mean, you have to with a raw file. You could just open a raw file and then save it as a JPEG or a TIFF. Um, but it needs work on it. That's the key. Um, and I actually think some cameras, uh, in the way that they produce a raw file and some software, how they interpret the raw file when you open it up, I think some cameras are more difficult to edit the images from. I remember having a Canon 5DS and uh, I found that to be a bit of a nightmare to edit because when you open up the raw files in Photoshop, they they started at such a low point, um, you know, in terms of the quality of the file. And then that camera got drowned in Iceland, accidentally, naturally. But <laughs> I promise. <laughs> but I ended up having that replaced by a 5D Mark IV. I can, and I, that was so much more uh, compliant. The raw files just seem much easier to work with. So, and with sensor technology now, it's a breeze. You what, what is your current go to? Well, I've just left Canon after 15 years and I've gone with the Nikon Z8. So, you've got to understand um, I worked for Wilkinson Cameras in 2013, so 10 years ago now and I would be responsible for selling a whole range of cameras. And at that time, we were looking at the Canon 5D Mark III versus, I think it might have been the 800, the D800 from, Can uh, from Nikon. And they were your two top sort of selling cameras. And the, so the Nikons had a Sony sensor in them, and they wiped the floor with Canon on their sensor technology. So us Canon users would look across thinking, yeah, I mean... <laughs> I love the functionality of Canon cameras and the menu system, but I mm. would say there were times when we'd look at the Nikon, you know, the Nikon cameras with envy and with jealousy, thinking if we could just have that sensor in the Canon camera, that would be perfection for me. But no, we, we kept with Canon and then eventually they caught up with the 5D Mark IV was a marked improvement over the Mark III, not on paper, but in reality, in, in the field. And, uh, and the 850, the Nikon D850 was the definitive landscape camera, 45 megapixels, amazing sense of technology. And you can shoot three stops under exposed and still pull back the details in the shadows. It was mind blowing. I'd sit there around a table with six clients, you know, on a workshop and say, right, throw me a card and I would put it in the machine. And then it would bring up a, you know, an image and they'd say, oh yeah, let's work on this one. And it'd be three stops under exposed. So the sky was perfect. Um, and then I said, well, that's a write-off because it's so dark. The, the foreground's so dark. We're just lighting up the shadows. And with a Canon, you simply couldn't do that. And I said, ah, this would be a waste of time. But we did. I couldn't even it. And I remember sitting there. And Tony, my very good friend, Tony Higginson, was sat next to me. We were in uh, Northumberland. And we were gobsmacked at the, the dynamic range and the ability to re you know get back the details. And so the Nikon, to me, was always the definitive camera. And then last month he brought out the Z8 and the mirrorless range of cameras that brought out hasn't really excited me enough to switch from Canon. But that Z8 is exemplary. What a camera. So I went all in. All the Canon gear got sold and 14 grand went on Nikon equipment. So I've got six lenses. Uh, well, actually two Z8s. One of them's on order. Um, and and still with a Sony sensor. Yeah. No. Oh. No, I think it's Nikon's own now. But no bugger will tell me, so I don't know. But I think it's Nikon's own. Or it's uh, Nikon designed and Sony have made it. No, I, I, I think that's the case, yeah. I think so. And Nikon were always more able to get more out of the Sony sensor than Sony could. 
in terms of dynamic range and low noise. But I have to say, there's just no noise on this uh, Z8. And it's, you know, the screen technology is fantastic. The range of motion on the screen itself, um, it's just, they've just nailed it. It's, and I was in Iceland, uh, well, just got back from Iceland yesterday, but last week, uh, for the very first time I filmed the eruption, um, the volcanic eruption, I was probably 150 foot from the crater. And I had never shot video on this camera. I only had it a couple of weeks prior. Uh, eventually figured it out the way it went. Unbelievable 4K footage. Oh, just fantastic. Uh, it's such an easy camera to use. So I had to say, I am now a Nikon fanboy. And I put my money where, where my mouth is. Um, and I love everything about it. I don't think there's one thing, apart from battery usage, not great on batteries. But the, the, um, it, uh, apparently the focusing yeah. is, isn't super snappy but that shouldn't make any difference for you no because you know mountains don't move <laughs> please to say albeit very slowly <laughs> yes that's true but no nikon now um yeah which is a big departure you know and for a lot of people who have known you for using one particular brand and then suddenly shift with no warning that's the key it's now, not a lot of people went know. sony yeah about five years ago yeah six seven years ago when is it really were the first to come out with true top end full frame mirrorless cameras? I mean, you know, you've got the other one from Pentax, but they're not mainstream really. You know, they were way ahead of Canon and Nikon. They were very much lag behind, and so many were. You know, the choice of the wedding photographer, especially that electronic viewfinder, was a game changer for them. Oh yeah, I, I'm. I mean, being when you were sort of uh, ten years ago, um, my camera of choice was one of the early what you could consider a mirrorless camera um even though it did technically have a a mirror that you just uh that, that you could see through it was a translucent as they called it it was uh, the, the S Sony. yeah the slt 77 no, 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 yes i used to sell them they were the very first iteration really before the a7s uh i think it was the a33 a55 i think something like a65 i remember yeah it had a um, it sort of had an electronic viewfinder, I think, but it had a mirror. It was a, like a hybrid, really. Yeah, so it's basically, it had a, a semi-translucent mirror that yeah. was always in front of the uh, sensor that didn't flip up. The viewfinder was electronic, yes. um, and all the slight uh, reflection from the mirror was for, was for the focusing system. Okay. Yeah, it was quite forward thinking from Sony. My very first SLR was a Minolta 5D, which then, the following year, Sony bought um, Minolta and rebadged. Really? Well, that's what I bought the following year. And it was a Minolta 5D, but with Steady Shot. It had that was their IBIS, uh, their, their Steady Cam uh, feature, Steady Shot feature. That was so, it was strange actually buying a Sony. So I kind of started with, uh, with Konica Minolta. Then went to Sony for uh, maybe a year. Then I went to Canada, I think back end of 20, 2008, I think it was. So yes, the Sony A100, that's what I, I took that to New Zealand with me in 2008. Wow, with a, two kit lenses and Coke and filters. And mine, mine had an issue where you couldn't see outside of a certain angle. And so oh. my, my shots were always sort of slightly to the left <laughs> well it might have improved mine i don't know <laughs> i mean yeah it was it was yeah it was it was quite an exciting time though wasn't it really in the sort of um when i used to work for comic up until 2007 um you know you know and i was i remember being in the late 90s so probably about 99 maybe 2000 maybe even 2001 you know digital cameras coming out and me owning a little pocket uh, olympus 1.3 million pixel 1.3 but the ability to take a shot and review it on the back of the screen however pixelated over a one inch screen was quite revolutionary and then i went around australia and new zealand in 2003 with a 3.2 megapixel sony compact camera uh with a bigger screen at the back and of course it was a step up but it was quite an exciting time really to be into photography and I hadn't really shot film before that, so I really only considered myself a digital uh, chap rather than the old sort of film days. 
but I was there right at the start of the digital revolution, working for one of the big retailers. So we used to get the modern equipment coming in, and it was, you know, I was always known as a camera guy. So anybody coming in for a camera or a camcorder, go and see Mel over there, and uh, he'll sort you out. But uh, very different times now, twenty years on. <laughs> when what point did you start to realise that um, you wanted to do the the the, the, um, the yeah the well not necessarily the photography but the actual workshops for it well that, that's interesting yes uh, well i think i mean having bought the camera in 2007 the the, the the minolta um and then i just sort of slowly over a period of a number of years just got better and better at taking imagery i think that's the key thing here is putting the time and the effort in to improve your own craft because I think a lot of people jump into workshops far too early in their journey and um, you know and, and struggle as a consequence I think but I spent seven years you know building up my interest but I would say when I joined the camera club in 2000 and September 2007 and I was with them for about eight years and then I got involved in lots of you know on the committee and I used to be the outdoor events coordinator, so I would get people together, take them out uh, on location, and I really enjoyed that aspect. So everything initially started organically for free as part of a camera club environment. And we ended up, I think when I joined, we had about 42 members. And when I became president in 2011, 2012, I think we had about 92, 94 members. So the membership had grown by twice the amount. Um, and I just, I just really used to get a kick out of helping people where I could, you know, the newcomers coming through, um, you know, then I became a judge so that I could give feedback from the limited experience that I had. And I still do that uh, for Photo Crowd, which is a big online uh, competition website. And, um, and, I, and I found actually having images, prints set around the room, I often found that that really helped my, my compositional side of things with photography i would study imagery you know uh, online and also in the flesh as well and um so the element of helping people has always been there but then when i left nursing in 2012 very early 2012 that i eventually turned pro it just seemed a natural extension that i you know could offer uh, tuition and guidance to those again coming through like I would have done six, seven years before. For me, it was the camera club environment that helped me. And also gave me focus and a direction. And I think anybody who started out in photography, you could do a lot worse than to join a camera club, assuming it's a good one, of course, and really get involved. And, uh, you know, it's help people and people help you. It's, you know, it's a two way street, isn't it? And, um, uh, you know, from some of the more established members, but that can give you a drive. It can give you a, a, a goal to aim for. And for me, it was, you know, trying to win camera club competitions because I am fairly competitive. <laughs> and so I had my eyes on two chaps in particular, and uh, and eventually, I, you know, some success came my way, and then I ended up leaving. But you've got to be, you've got to find the triggers in life that sort of drive you on, and then work towards that. So. But we were at shops, I think, and there's an interesting point. You've got to be personable. And thankfully, for whatever reason, you know, I love being around people. Of course, there are times when I love being on my own in between. Uh, but on a workshop environment, what I found was, and I actually discovered this through nursing. So I did a three-year uh, diploma course in nursing. And I really struggled, really, really struggled. I went into it at, what, 35, 36. But I struggled because I found out that I am an excellent short-term project manager. Something I can give my all to in a short period of time. But a three-year nursing course was way outside of my scope. And by halfway through, I was floundering, really struggling. And I got to within six weeks of qualifying near the end of three years and I, I walked. I, I quit. And I said, no, photography is for me, nursing is not. And everybody thought I was absolutely crazy. But I realized that workshops are perfect for my personality. And you don't realize that until you get a little older and you figure out how you work, what drives you. And, uh, you know, giving it your all for a week or 10 days on a workshop is perfect. 
you know, and uh, you can give it, you know, 100%. And then come home, take a few days to refresh, re energize, and then go again. And that is perfect for me. If Do you I find was... that you uh, crash when you get home? Yeah. And I, actually, it's, it's interesting because uh, who was I reading about this morning? And they were talking about um, experiencing a low after a high. And I'm trying to remember who I read about this morning, but I think there might have been some sort of artist. or. Uh, and the problem is, you know, they'll get to go out on stage and have this amazing gig. And then you have this lull, this crash for a few days. And I kind of go a little bit that way. So I get home after, you know, being away for a week and I've given it my all and I'm, I'm spent. The fridge is empty. And I come home and I've got to spend three, four, five days restocking that fridge and then ready to go. The social battery. I prefer that to a fridge because now I'm hungry. Mm. A social battery. Yeah, well, I can kind of understand that. And even for somebody as extrovert as me, and I think there are a lot of introverts in this industry where actually they'd rather not have people around them, but it pays the bills. And so there's a conflict of interest there in terms of their personality versus the reality that they've got to live. I am just so blessed to love what I do. And so the two sit harmlessly, you know, uh, I'm, I'm honestly together. And uh, yeah, I'm a very extrovert person, you know, in that I can be part of a group and lead a group and want to be involved and I'm interested in people. Um, and then when I get home, I can be very introvert and just take the time to re-energize. So I, I can kind of understand, you know, how a lot of people in that situation can be because you just come down from a high of a week away somewhere or, or anything that you do that you really, really enjoy. I uh, only to get home and then that just disappear. I think you end up with the coping mechanisms as to how you get over that, you know. And uh, so there are probably certain things that I do. Ice cream, <laughs> Netflix. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's probably Netflix, you can take it with you now. Um, but yeah, so I think you just, so after 10 years, you get to know how, how you work and uh, and you just run your life in a way that just works all the time, you know, and that's just experience in any field of, uh, of work, I suppose. But yeah, definitely do enjoy my own company when I come home, but I need that time to go again and you know within a few days so definitely social battery i shall have to remember that is excellent i'm having that one. yeah you can take that one <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so it's so the um in terms of uh setting up a uh a workshop um what what does that process involve well that's a good question um all right, let's give you let's give you Japan as an example in April. So the normal the normal context of, of running a workshop is that I will sit at home and I think, where do I want to go to next? Where do I want to lead a workshop? Which country? Because now most of my trips are now abroad. What country uh, do I want to visit? So quite selfishly, but also one that is also on people's bucket list. It's not fun going to a place and spending ten thousand pounds on a place. And then coming out, we're not being able to sell it. And of course, I've done that in the past because uh, you never quite know what sells unless you go to the usual hotspots. But so I will sit there. And now, Japan was a prime example. I ended up uh, becoming friends with a chap who lives in the Philippines who runs tours to Japan. So we set up, you know, um, a, a three week period in which I went over. I uh, spent 10 days with Francis. So you spend essentially time and money. Now, in this instance, he had the agenda, but I would normally have to research a lot before I go out. New Zealand was the same. Canada was the same. And I would spend months researching places, you know, car parks, um, you know, cafes, eateries, all that sort of thing, because the logistics are really important. Then you go out for, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks. You spend thousands and thousands of pounds. You, you know push your backside getting the images from dawn till dusk and then you come home you edit those images <clears throat> whilst all well, all the while of course whilst trying to run a business and running tours uh, and in a very short period of time you then got to create the workshop book the hotels figure out the flights and all the logistics of Kamahaya 
and any rules and regulations you need to abide by. And then put the workshop together on your website and then you've got to launch it. And it's very strange, you know, when you put so much effort into a one location, you know, be it Canada, wherever it happens to be, Tuscany, I almost liken it to uh, a musical artist who has spent six to eight, nine months creating an album. And that's me. And that's the workshop in a nutshell. It's my album. And then you launch it out there. You email it to your subscribers. You put it on social media and you sit back. And in a way that an artist would hope that you'd enjoy the music, um, I hope that people will enjoy the images and say, I want to go to wherever it is that I'm uh, going. So... At yeah. this point, you've already got the hotel booked. Yes, well, yes. <laughs> it more, more often than not, um, you do, because certain places you need to book way in advance. And if you're running a workshop for the first time, it may be that you've got to put a cash advance in. Um, you know, where, say, Iceland, I've been 16 times now. And so now I have an arrangement with the hotels that I paid two weeks before, or I just pay when I get there. And that's a real advantage when you're established in that you don't have to spend three, four, five thousand pounds, six thousand pounds on accommodation when you've not taken a penny. And so people will then obviously uh, go on the website and they can book straight away. They can pay a deposit. I've got a booking system on there uh, through WooCommerce. You know, we spent a lot of time and energy getting the website absolutely perfect and the, and the way that it runs. And um, yeah, and then of course you've then got all of the uh, the communication side of things, the emailing, the logistics in uh, their flights and to their, you know, the hotels before they, you know, if you're going somewhere like Japan, they'll want to arrive a couple of days before. So there's a lot of to and fro on information. And then you've got to go out and run the workshop. So the actual amount of time that you spend putting together a workshop is phenomenal. I mean, you actually end up working harder before the workshop starts than you do actually running it. It's crazy. But it is, it is, yeah, it is similar to putting an album out there. And then if you fill that workshop, you think that's fantastic. I mean, the buzz that you get from that, when you see an email come in and there's another booking come in, you think that is amazing. It's hard to explain, but actually the, the needs of the business has changed because at one time it was probably 70% return custom. And now we still get that, but we get a lot more now coming in from Google, from other countries because the website now is ranking, you know, globally and therefore more people internationally are seeing uh, what I offer. So so the business has changed a little bit in that sense, but it, it, it is a, it's, it's a genuine thrill that something personal that you've created, and it is personal, you know, it's not just a question of me hooking up with somebody else who's done all the work, who's got all the experience and the knowledge. Apart from Japan, that never happens. It's all on me. And there's a real buzz and a real kick that you get out of something that you put your heart and soul into that then other people they want to be part of. It's fantastic. There's, there's very few feelings like it. And that's what drives me on, I think, really. And that's after 10 years, I still get that buzz and that, that energy rush, that adrenaline rush when I think, fantastic. I've got six, seven people that I'm going to, you know, hopefully entertain for a week and show them some beautiful parts of the world. I mean, what a job, what a life. I could be working for a living. So um, it's fair to say you've been to a couple of countries. And uh, yes. what would you say is the, the best way to travel with gear? Best way to travel with gear? Um, in terms of uh, the logistics, I mean, I have a suitcase, 23, 25 kilos. I have my main tripod in there. Uh, I have a travel tripod, so I always take two tripods with me. The second, uh, the smaller tripod, which is a Benro Tortoise, an excellent tripod actually for traveling uh, with. Uh, it will either go on the backpack or it'll sit in the um, in the suitcase. Um, if you're going to somewhere like Iceland or Norway in the winter, when you've got to carry thicker clothing, you know, maybe wellies or overshoes, then you're going to have issues with weight with, the, with your suitcase. So that becomes quite critical. Um, I have a Shimoda Explore V2 bag, a 35 litre that carries two camera bodies and five lenses uh, and my drone. I mean, it's a remarkable bag. And then potentially the travel tripod. And I have never, in 10 years of travel, I've been asked to weigh my hand luggage. 
never. And thank heavens that is the case. Because if they're giving you eight or nine kilos and I've got 14, 15, 16, which I have for now, and certainly when I'm when I'm walking around day to day, there's probably 13 to 15 kilos on my back. I mean, it's little wonder why my back is slowly eroding. Um, but never had any issues in traveling. Now, if you're going to go to Lofoten, the third of the three flights are on a little 40-seater prop plane. That's the only plane that I will give them my carry-on camera bag and say, put it in the hole. I see the guy, put it in the hole, and it's safe. <laughs> Half an hour later, we're landing. It comes out of that hold, gives it to me. Do not trust. Yes. I mean, I, I've... I have never had to put my camera backpack in the hold. Now, the ways I get around that is I tend to book speedy booking, uh, speedy boarding, so that you're the first on the flight as best you can. Therefore, there's plenty of overhead locker space. Um, you know, if it's EasyJet, I came back with EasyJet yesterday, speedy boarding, it's fine. Get as close to the front of the aircraft as possible. Get the bag up there. And of course, when you get off the plane, you're one of the first ones to get off it as well. Um, or if you can afford to go, you know, premium economy or business, that, that, that's even better. Um, but yes, yeah, so I've never really had, and I also take my laptop with me in a separate bag. Uh, that also goes in the overhead as well, but you can put that underneath your seat. So, you know, it depends. Most of the time you've got a big 25, 23 kilo suitcase. Um, I take my sat nav with me. I have a TomTom -tom sat nav that has all of my locations worldwide on it. All right, now, um, as a consequence, that comes and uh, with me in the camera in the laptop bag. Because if you lose your luggage, if the airline loses your luggage, at least when you get into your hire car, you have the means to get around. That you, you know, you've got all your locations in there. So there are certain little tips and tricks that you learn over the years, you know, to uh, in how you carry certain pieces of equipment. Now I have to say, the only two times that my luggage has been lost and returned within three days. Uh, was flying through Frankfurt. Don't do it. <laughs> Even Manchester Airport say, do not fly through Frankfurt. They are horrendous at losing your bags. Um, but other than that, I've you know I've never had an issue. Um, I've been incredibly lucky with luggage generally. Um, even going to Iceland two weeks ago, I booked the flight that morning at half past nine, and I was on the flight in a taxi at the airport and I arrived with five minutes to boarding and all the systems had shut down. He said, the guy had fired up the systems and it said to me, right, I'll take your suitcase. And I was wondering, is that suitcase going to join all the other ones that are sat there in a, in a cage? And it did. I mean, amazingly enough, it did. So even pushing the airlines sometimes to their edge, to their limit, they still deliver. So I've been very fortunate actually with luggage. And it can be a problem, and I, and I hear of it a lot, but, you know, look at your girls missing. But I have a spare suitcase at home with a lot of things that are duplicated in it. So if I come home and the baggage isn't there, the suitcase isn't there, and I have to fly within four days, I have a backup. So, uh, yeah, that's the secret. Be prepared. Have a plan B. It's so important. Get the logistics right and you'll be fine. So um, you haven't had any sort of uh, anything happen with the, uh, the, the luggage side of things, but is there any... Anything that's happened on the actual trips itself that's uh, memorable? Um, well, where I'm concerned, I think I've drowned two cameras in Iceland. Uh, one was 2016, the 5D, yeah, the 5DS, and then the 5D Mark IV, unfortunately, got uh, drowned again in Iceland. And then they replaced that with the EOS R mirrorless cam cannon. So I kind of went on to the, uh, the, the sort of mir mirrorless revolution. Um, we did have a guy in Tuscany last year who had uh, a Pentax full frame with a very long lens, 400 mil, 100, 400, I think it was, uh, because, you know, some of the farmhouses are a little further away. And because he'd taken off the tripod collar off the lens uh, in order to travel and keep everything quite nice and neat so he didn't stick out, he forgot to put that back on. And needless to say, the first morning we were there, uh, pre-dawn, you know, he gets out his camera, he puts the lens on without the tripod collar, puts the camera on the tripod itself rather than the tripod collar. Front weighted heavy, he didn't have his tripod set up properly. And uh, and Albert went and it damaged his, uh, his lens snapped in two. Now, normally I would go through camera equipment the night before. This is important. So you learn these tips and tricks. Depends when you pick everyone up from the airport. But 
when you get to the air, uh, the hotel, you say, right, I want to get your camera equipment out. We're going to make sure that your cameras are set up properly. So people will have it set on JPEG and forget to put it back onto RAW for whatever reason. Or they'll have it on like ISO 3200 because they've been shooting Astro three days before. Or they haven't formatted the cards or any number of things. Set the time and date of your camera because when you go home and you look back at your images, you want an accurate representation of when you took it because you might then want to go back out yourself two, three years down the road and you kind of want to know, you know, at what point in time you shot that image so that you can then best prepare an itinerary for yourself. So there's lots of things actually, but we've been actually quite lucky where clients are concerned with camera equipment. It's not often that they have a mishap. I think I've just been quite blessed, but I've said that now. And in six weeks when I start playing again, <laughs> I'm sure blame you, Jay, when the first three come, you know, without the suitcases and, and uh, camera bags that are all drowned. <laughs> so, so where do they stand in terms of a, uh, a workshop and gear being damaged on a workshop? Does that come on to your insurance or theirs? Uh, it only comes on to mine if I'm liable. Um, and what you'll often find when you're booking a workshop or a tour, when you read the terms and conditions, it always stipulates that a condition of your booking with the tour company is that you must have travel insurance. You don't have to have camera insurance, but any sensible person would have camera insurance uh, for damage, for theft, but yes, if I am liable personally, fine. If I kick somebody's bag over the edge of a cliff, of course, that's my issue. But if uh, they leave it on a beach and the tide's coming in and I say to them, put your bag on your shoulder, put it on your back, and that often is the case, and they don't, and the bag gets wet, then, then that's on them. But So there are certain things that you can do to mitigate the risk because you've got to imagine a lot of people actually aren't used to traveling and shooting every day for five, six days, seven days. They get tired, you know, mistakes happen, accidents happen if they're not careful. So I've got to try and make sure that they're well hydrated. I buy water, we keep them in the van, drink water, drink water, especially in hotter climates. Because, you know, tiredness and this comes through nursing, a dehydrated body, you lose focus, mistakes will happen. And my job is to try and mitigate the risks as much as possible. Because as nice as it is to get the imagery, at the end of the trip, it's more important that you've done it safely and, you know, and enjoyably. So, you know, I think that's probably where my care work comes into advantage. And also a lot of my clients are probably, you know, of the more mature age, let's just say. And of course, you know, that would be the bulk of my client base when I was nursing. So I think there's a lot of transferable skills there. But now we've been very, very blessed, actually. There's very little that has actually gone wrong. Uh, we've had a couple of Nikons in the past in very cold climates that have struggled to fire up, uh, but I've seen to have worked to my magic and got them working. But I always like to have a second body with me uh, and a second lens because should something happen to somebody's camera, you can then at least say, well, listen, here's my camera. Absolutely. You know, and, and it will be an expensive loaner. You'd be looking at six 6,000 quid's worth. However, you don't want their trip ruined you know, by the, because, you know, cameras do break. They they do stop working. I had a Fuji a couple of years ago, uh, GFX 100S uh, on loan from Fuji. It was an absolute nightmare. Sorry, Fuji, if you listen to this, but it was an absolute nightmare. And um, yeah, thankfully I had my own Canon with me. I was in Ireland. So stuff does go wrong and, you know, for no explicable reason. And so it's nice to know that you've at least got something to back up. Take two tripods. You know, if something happens to one of their tripods, you've then got a backup. You know, it's trying to maximize uh, people's enjoyment. And of course, they're going to be annoyed if they damage their own camera, but they'll be scared of damaging yours, but at least they can continue to shoot. And that's important for me that they're able to do that. How, how much of the time do you think is is teaching and answering questions and herding cats? It's, well, it depends on the group dynamics. I think... Um, I mean, you kind of get split up into, into various categories. So if you, say, have seven clients with you, seven attendees, I hate the term clients, actually. It's attendees. Clients makes it sound very business-like, and I hope that's not how it comes across because, you know, I get paid to do what I love to do, but it, it is a business, but it, it shouldn't feel like one. But so out of those seven, you might have two that are very experienced in shooting 30 years. They've got top-end likers, um, you know, 
uh, even medium format cameras, you know, the odd hassle blad every now and then. And they simply want to be taken to the right place at the right time. And they enjoy the conviviality of a group session, you know, and having everybody together, you know, chew the fat over a meal um, and just be involved. And then you probably get out of the remaining five, you might get three who are proficient, but will have questions every now and then. And then you'll probably have one or two who are newbies and what I call newbies, where they might have even bought brand new equipment and never used it. I mean, that's interesting. But, and so you have to spend quite a bit of time with them. Uh, but I would say then, you know, the ones who were very experienced, well, they don't want anything from you other than to be taken. So it's not too bad. If you get five out of seven who were newbies, which is very unusual, then you've got to work much harder on that trip in that sense. But then also sometimes that's sometimes a more rewarding aspect because you felt that you've made a, a bigger change and a bigger a bigger uh, influence, I suppose, a bigger contribution to the end of your workshop. You might be more spent. You might have, you know, uh, your little brain might have been rattling around for 12 or 14 hours a day for a week. But at the end of it, you put more into it, but then you get more out of it. And you see the the journey that these people are on. I have a private Facebook group that people can join who, are, you know, who attended a workshop or a one-to-one. And they post and you get to see the development over the years and it's a lovely it's a lovely thing to see and to know that you've been a part of that however big however small and uh, and, and i just i love that sense of community that we have people will ask a question about insurance printing anything and if i don't know the answer we've got you know over 300 members in there that will answer it so it's all these things that you're building and you're creating something you know and so yeah the some of the workshops which can prove to be quite challenging can also be the most rewarding so that's how you've got to look at it so some photographers is i think it's fair to say can be quite sort of shall we say self-focused <laughs> and naturally um you want to create your own work as well so how much do you find mm. that helping others versus creating your own work uh, where, where do you think that balance is for you? Ooh, well, that's a very good question. When I started out, I actually asked the question on Facebook, on my photography page. Um, in running workshops, do you deem it acceptable for the workshop leader to take their own imagery? And it was an interesting response I thought that the vast majority would say you do not take your own imagery we're paying you to teach us you should be out there taking your own pictures but actually it was much more 50 50 than, than than I imagined so on the one side of the coin people said yes absolutely we want to see what you get on location while we're there and then in post-processing sessions bringing that image to life and you know and absolutely and then the other 50 percent said absolutely not because you're there for me i'm paying you to be there not the other way around and that's interesting now what i found to actually be the case of was shoot by all means and i had this feedback from a lot of people who've been with a lot of other photographers and workshop leaders the issue lay in that when you arrive on location and honestly some of the stories i've heard have been horrendous in that the workshop leader will immediately walk almost half a mile away with their own tripod, with their own camera, and they will leave the group out of sight to get their own work. And I, I, I can't get my head around that in any way, shape or form. And so people were quite happy for you to shoot so long as there was an element of education and a bit of training about it. Now, I know how long it takes people to set up when you're on location. I've, if I've been to the location many times, I know what works. I can be out of the van and I can have the you know, camera on the tripod within two minutes. I can have a shot within you know, three or four minutes while everybody is setting up. And I let everybody set up. And then I let everybody compose an image. That's the important bit here, because I love composing. And then I go around one at a time and I say, okay, what about this composition? You know, what is it that you're wanting to capture within the imagery? And so you, you instead of just saying stand here, F8, ISO 100, shoot that, and you know, you've got your, your, your sort of tripod in the tripod holes. 
I think there has to be much more one-on-one. Try and understand what it is that interests them and then work towards having them think more intently about what they want to shoot rather than me just saying, right, everybody line up, shoot that. And actually, there was a friend of mine that was on a trip in Tuscany recently. Uh, a very big name, I won't name him, but he's a very big international photographer. And he heard him stand there with uh, 10, was it 12 clients? And they said, right, everybody, ISO 100, F8, 24 mil, blah, blah. And he bar- you know, bleated out a, a list of instructions. And then when they got that, he then said, and now you're free to get your own images. I had a surrenders. He said, if I'd have been on that workshop, I'd have told him where to go. And I thought that was a really interesting take from somebody who goes on workshops. And I don't do that at all. And so I try and work one-on-one with people and, and try and bring out of them a creative element rather than me just barking orders at them. And I think that's the role of a teacher, of a tutor, uh, in a way that sort of, you know, helps people think more intricately about what it is that they want to capture. And that's what I do. So I'm very much of, of the essence uh, of, uh, of of the mindset of, I'll give you a fishing rod and the bait, and I'm going to teach you how to fish rather than present the fish to you on a plate. Because the next time I'm not going to be there a week later with you. And I want to teach you certain elements that the next time you're on your own, that you can actually use to get the shot that you want. And that's in, that's a big part of it for me. And sometimes I will say, look at what I've taken. And I'll bring them over to the camera or bring the camera to them and say, look at that. And I'll use it as a training lesson. So take your own images by all means. And, and people actually do want to see what you get. And your followers, you know, also want to want to see what you get. If you go to Tuscany or the Dolomites for a week or Slovenia, they want to see images. That's what you're known for. So the basis of the business is that you take photographs. And so do it, but do it in a way which benefits others and not just yourself. So the uh, the final part I wanted to go into um, was what happens on the downtime on your uh, excursions. Downtime. Yeah, so... Um, we don't get much downtime. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mean in between shooting and the post-processing sessions and various... Just, um, so... It's almost impossible to shoot for 24 hours. So at yes. some point you stop. Yes. How does the downtime work in, in terms of your general? Uh, I mean, it, it does vary depending on workshops. I'd say, let's take Slovenia. So I did Slovenia for the first time October last year. And uh, because of the times of the year and the, and the sunlight and various other things, and the sunrise and sunset times, we would be out at, say, you know, 4.30 in the morning. And then we would shoot and go back for breakfast. And for those that didn't want to go out early, we would then meet them for breakfast. And then after that, they could shower, spend an hour, hour and a half to themselves so that, you know, they could have a cat nap or they could have a shower or get themselves refreshed or do whatever they want to do. And then we go out sort of, you know, about 10 a.m. And then we're out until 8, 8.30 and then we're in a restaurant until 9.30 and then they're back for 10 p.m. Yeah, after a week of that, yeah, people are on their knees, I have to say, me included. But, and I do that twice over, we've got two trips back to back. So you get no downtime on Slovenia. Um, when you, you know, if the weather's poor, you have to get back, um, then yes, you try and book a place where you can actually have people around the table and you can set up your, you know, your laptop and you can go through uh, some post-processing uh, techniques and various things. And image review is important because they might be doing something wrong or incorrect uh, that I haven't picked up on on location, which is quite rare. And then that will manifest itself through the images I see. I think, ah, okay, we've now got a problem that's ironing out for the rest of the trip. So that's quite important. But if it's somewhere like Iceland, you know, in the winter, when we're going in February, where, you know, sunrise is 9.30, nearly 10 o'clock in the morning, and sunset's 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So you might be shooting for eight hours, an hour before, an hour after. And then you have two, two and a half hours off be- between going back to the hotel, relaxing, having a shower, and then having your meal, and then going out for the Aurora. You could be heading out at 8, 8.30 at night, but not coming back until midnight if there's a great Aurora display. So again, you don't actually get a lot of downtime, I have to say. <laughs> um, but we try and structure it in a way that for those that don't want to go out at 4, 5, 6 a.m., if it's Tuscany in September, 
our first location is normally 200 yards from the hotel. That's why I picked the hotel. It's brilliant. Uh, Casanova. And I actually think a lot of, and it's interesting, I look at a lot of other people's workshops and tours around the world for guidance. I'm interested in, because I'm quite nosy and I'm quite methodical in, in what I do. And, uh, and I like to understand uh, much more intricately the industry, not just what I do, but how I can learn from other people. And I look at how other people structure their workshops and I think, oh, wow, so you're going to spend seven days in that location, but actually your sunrise and sunset locations are an hour away or an hour and a half away, whereas I'm maybe 15 minutes away, 20 minutes away. And I think, all right, well, in that case, my clients are going to get more sleep because I'm not going to be spending it, you know, three hours in a bus. So I look at the logistics and try and figure out less time traveling, more time shooting. And, um, you know, and I think that's quite important. Logistics, logistics, logistics. I, honestly, I can't underestimate uh, how uh, how important logistics are. And there's a lot of tours out there that don't seem to manage logistics very, very well. But that's the key in going out there first. I know a lot of people go out there and the very first trip they do is with clients. And, uh, you know, which is fine, but you've really got to do the research. So... Um, you know, but after 10 years, I've pretty much got it nailed down now, at least to say. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, I'm very happy in that I've managed to, to get you on uh, to the show and to talk about something, not necessarily photography exactly, but photography, I would say probably photography adjacent in terms of the, the business aspect. Um, yes. probably, probably not something that a huge amount of people ask you to do. <laughs> No, but you know, I, 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 mean, I really enjoy this chat. So thanks for having me on, Jay. And, it, and it's actually been interesting talking about the business of photography rather than just, you know, my journey or, or, or my work, but the actual industry of how we go about doing what we do. And so it's certainly, I think that's very interesting for me, whether it will be for anyone else, hopeful. Well, I find it interesting. Well, that's excellent. I mean, you're still awake, which is always a bonus, but... Um, I think there'll be people out there that want to do what I do. And I get plenty of emails and, and personal and private comments asking how I go about or how, what advice I would give them to go about doing what I do. Um, and so I think there's a lot of people out there that would love to do what I do, but just don't simply know how to start and how to develop. So hopefully there's some little tips in there that might steer them in the right direction than, you know, than fantastic. But uh, it's a subject not often talked about, but it, it's important. Well, I want to thank you for, for coming on to the show. Uh, just so that the listeners can know, where can people find you? Well, they can find me on my website, uh, melvinnicholson.co.uk. Uh, you can find my social feeds from there, Facebook, Instagram, Thread, YouTube, uh, Flickr. And one other point, we're setting up a company this summer. Uh, it's a dedicated photography workshop and tour company called Landscape Locations. And this is going to allow me to be able to offer workshops that are going to be run by freelance photographers in genres and parts of the world that I, uh, I'm either unfamiliar with. Um, because I want to offer a wider range of, of tours that I currently offer. So that's a really exciting development on my 10th year to actually put together a company, a dedicated company that's going to involve other people offering their skill sets in astrophotography, things that I'm not really particularly au fait with, uh, architectural photography, which I do love, but there's some amazing workers out there. And so, um, yeah, Landscape Locations will be launched shortly, but uh, that's a really exciting development this year. If you uh, shoot me across the link, I will also include that in the show notes for the uh, for the podcast. Okay. Excellent. Well, the website's currently being built. I'll do that as soon as it's ready. <laughs> Excellent. So I, I want to take. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to come on the show. I've really enjoyed the conversation, and it's a, a different aspect of the photography that I think that a lot of people will be uh, interested in. Well, pleasure's been all mine, Jay. Thank you very much. Okay. So at the end of the show, I always say it's easy if you put the effort in. This is Jay signing off.